Have you ever wondered why you keep ending up in the same kind of relationships, repeating the same kind of patterns? Maybe you keep finding yourself either pushing people away or clinging to them desperately for a sense of reassurance and validation. Today, we're going to be diving deeply into the world of attachment theory. Basically, it's a framework that explains why we act the way that we do in relationships and how these patterns were formed long before we were even aware of them. Attachment theory is one of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal to understand our patterns in relationships. This is a major, major, major game changer for your understanding. Once I understood attachment theory and started applying this lens to my relationships and to my work with clients, it's like the matrix unlocked and so many things became far more obvious, so much more understandable. Everything started to make sense in a new light. And that's what I wanna try to transmit to some of you today. This is actually going to be stage one or episode one of a multi-part series that I'm gonna be doing around attachment theory. So if you're new here, welcome to The Conscious Masculine. My name is Jasper Brown. Chances are by now you've heard about attachment, you've, uh, you've heard about anxious, avoidance, these kind of terms get thrown around a lot. On social media these days, attachment science has become very popular. Whether you are avoidant, anxious, secure or somewhere in between, your attachment style was shaped by your earliest relationships with your caregivers and it continues to play out in your life today. Understanding it not only helps you grow personally, but it can absolutely profoundly transform the way that you connect with others, whether that's in a love relationship, a friendship, or even in your professional life. So today we're gonna be breaking down what attachment theory actually is. There's a lot of information out there and sometimes it's a little bit hard to put it all together. So I wanna give you guys uh, a very clear explanation. This is gonna be the sort of foundational episode of this series. In that, we're gonna explore the four main attachment styles and I'm gonna be sharing some profound examples that go beyond the typical explanations that you'll hear out there on social media, in the world, talking to your friends or whoever. By the end of this episode, you'll have a much deeper understanding of why you behave the way that you do in relationships and how you can begin to start shifting yourself, your patterns towards a more secure, fulfilling kind of relationship and connection with others. So let's start with the simple question answering, what is attachment theory? So attachment theory was really developed by the British psychologist, John Bowlby who began studying the way that children form bonds with their caregivers. He became fascinated by the patterns that started to emerge in his research and started to see how these patterns not only applied to children, but actually continued throughout our lives. And that actually forms a certain blueprint a script that we continue to enact in our relationships, especially in our most intimate relationships where our attachment bonds are somehow the strongest and therefore these patterns are emerging and in many ways dictating the direction and how our, how our relationships play out. Mary Ainsworth later built on Bowlby's work 
and she started to conduct the famous uh, strange situation experiment, which observed how toddlers reacted to their caregivers leaving and returning to the room in which they were in. And they studied how these infants would react at seeing their caregiver disappear, if they would cry, if they would be ambivalent, they wouldn't care, and how they responded when their caregiver returned. Would they be happy, cheerful? Would they cry? And they started to make these very strong correlations and connections. And this really uh, gave a huge amount of weight once this evidence was um, somehow brought into the mainstream and validated. This became a very powerful uh, confirmation of the weight of attachment theory. Bowlby believed that attachment behavior such as seeking closeness or crying for attention, uh, crying for attention, these are actually not just random. These are these behavioral traits are actually survival mechanisms. As infants, we rely entirely on our caregivers for protection, for survival. So forming strong, bond, forming strong bonds with them is absolutely essential. Otherwise we die, we perish. We're literally completely dependent on our caregivers. So the quality of the bond that we have or the lack of the bond actually creates the foundation of our attachment style. At its core, attachment isn't just about love or emotional closeness, it's about survival. Our brains are in fact actually wired from birth to seek out attachment as a way for us to feel safe in the world. And the patterns that we develop in our earliest relationships don't just go away, they follow us into adulthood and they play out in every connection that we make. Pretty profound, right? And it makes sense. When you think about it, as a child, we are this blank slate. We're like a unprogrammed CPU or hard drive with no, very little scripting. As we come into the world, we're just a sponge for information. And the way that our first connections, the first relationships, the most important relationships happen and play out they're going to program us. So the way that our parents respond, the way that our, they soothe us or ignore us in different situations is going to be some of the first imprints that we have about the nature of attachment at all in our life. Because we're so sensitive and so easily programmed in that stage of life, uh, that gets hardwired into our system. How could it be any other way, right? And those experiences then build up patterns. Those patterns start to play out. We start to confirm them. They start to um, yeah, get reinforced and become deeper and deeper and deeper inside of us. And when we understand this, when we start to see these patterns and how they've emerged in us throughout our life and play out in our relationships, this is a profound tool which can help us to optimize the way that we relate, the way that we engage, the way that we create relationships, because so much more is going to make sense to us. And in its absence, if we don't have that understanding, we're like a mystery to ourselves. We simply don't understand why we behave the way that we do. Whereas if we hold that information, if we have that lens to look at the patterns that exist in us and in our relationships, how those play out. As I said before, the matrix like opens up in front of us and we see, oh my God, wow. It makes so much sense. And uh, there's a reason why it's become so popular because it is very, very powerful to look at your life, your relationships, your attachments in this way. So now let's look at the four main attachment styles. 
This is going to be a bit of an overview, a quick sort of run through each one so you guys can get a bit of a mapping of what it means. So the first thing we're going to base this off is secure attachment, which is, uh, let's say, the most ideal state of attachment. It means we are secure in the way that we attach to others. Now, what that looks like, people with a secure attachment have or had caregivers who were consistently responsive to their emotional needs. When they were crying, when they were upset, when they needed something, their caregiver was available to them. And therefore, they feel comfortable with both closeness and independence. They're able to trust others and have a healthy balance of intimacy and autonomy in their relationships. Now, secure attachment represents about 50% of the population. So it's actually fairly common. But if you're in the dating landscape, you might not notice that. You might not be aware of that because secure, securely attached people tend to wind up in relationships and stay in relationships because they feel secure and comfortable in relationships. Whereas in the dating pool, we're much more likely to have people that are the other forms of attachment, which I'm about to talk about, and that will make more sense in just a minute. As an example of a securely attached uh, person or being, imagine, imagine a scenario in which a child falls down or you fell down as a boy or girl and you scrape your knee. A securely attached child knows that they can cry, run to their caregiver and receive comfort. They also trust that after the comforting moment, they can return to playing, knowing that their caregiver is there when they need them. Because they feel safe, reassured, protected and held by their caregiver. In adult life, this person likely feels confident in their relationships, they feel trusting, they feel that they can rely on their partner without fear of being rejected or overwhelmed. These individuals are fairly comfortable expressing their needs, their emotions, and they handle conflict fairly well. They know how to seek out healthy solutions in moments of difficulty, confusion, misunderstanding. And as I said before, they do tend to form long lasting, fulfilling relationships without that fear of being abandoned or being smothered or too close to someone else. And that's the ideal way that we should relate and form attachments in a secure sense. It's the best of both. We have closeness and we also have independence and autonomy. So that brings me to the second category, which is anxious attachment, otherwise known as preoccupied. So what that looks like is anxiously attached people had caregivers who were inconsistent, sometimes responsive to the child's needs and other times unavailable or unpredictable. This inconsistency created an anxiety around emotional connection, leading them to fear abandonment and seek constant reassurance in their relationships. Think of a child whose caregiver is sometimes nurturing and other times distracted or distant or uncaring seemingly. The child then adapts and becomes hypervigilant, trying to keep their caregiver's attention because they never know when they'll be available. In adult relationships, this person might cling to their partner, needing a constant reassurance that they're loved, that they're accepted, that they're seen, that they won't get abandoned. 
anxious attached people often feel very insecure in relationships. They worry constantly that their partner will leave and they can come across as needy or very emotionally intense. That's why they're called preoccupied because they're preoccupied with the needs of connection and intimacy and security and safety in the relationship. And they struggle with the uncertainty of whether their partner actually loves or values them, which creates this emotional roller coaster of highs and lows. Anxiously attached people don't just crave love. They, they really crave certainty. The unpredictable caregiving that they received as children leaves them feeling unsure of when love would be given or taken away, which leads to this constant search for reassurance and safety in their relationships as adults. And perhaps you resonate with that. The next category is the avoidant attachment, otherwise known as the dismissive. So what that looks like is basically avoidant attached people had caregivers who were emotionally distant or unresponsive to their needs. And as a result of that, they learned to rely on themselves rather than others. They developed this view of emotional closeness as a bit of a threat to their independence and autonomy. As an example, imagine a child who learns that crying or seeking comfort is met with indifference or even frustration from their caregiver. You were upset as a boy or a girl and you started crying and bawling in an attempt to get attention and your parent is fed up, they're overwhelmed, they don't have space or they're pissed off and annoyed by your pleas for help. And imagine that over time you just stop seeking help because you figured you're not going to get it anyway. Why, why keep crying? Why learn? Uh, why keep seeking that from your parent when they're, when you, they're literally, you can't rely on them. And so you learn to, um, you learn to soothe yourself essentially by creating distance as adults, people with, uh, avoidant attachment, keep others like further away at arm's length. They fear that emotional intimacy will trap them or make them vulnerable. Avoidant attached people tend to avoid emotional closeness and intimacy. They value that independence above all, and they may shut down or withdraw when relationships become too close, too intense. And their response to that, because they start to feel trapped, is to distance themselves and protect themselves from that feeling of vulnerability and exposure. So really avoidant attachment is rooted in self-protection. These individuals learned early on that emotional closeness was, wasn't, wasn't safe. So they learn to build these walls around themselves to avoid the risk of being hurt again and again and again. Now in relationships, this looks like emotional distance, but underneath all of that and all these strategies for maintaining autonomy, creating space, pushing others away, exists the same desire for connection. It's just hidden behind layers of fear. So the avoidant person is desperately craving the attachment, but they've simply learned that attachment doesn't feel safe because attachment is just a fundamental human need. We all have this innate longing and somehow non-negotiable need for attachment. You know, if you leave a child without its mother, once it's born, it will die within a matter of days. 
And that's why they found that, you know, these incubators and putting children, separating children from their mothers for weeks at a time or something that was profoundly traumatic. Because we actually have this deep, deep need for attachment that exists, it's hardwired into us. Without it, as a child, as a baby, you literally don't survive if you don't attach effectively to your caregiver. So we all have that built into us. The avoidant has just learned that it's not safe. Mum or dad or caregiver couldn't be relied upon. Therefore, as I grow up, I just have to learn to take care of myself and push people away if things get too close because closeness was, uh, wasn't was safe. So that's avoidant attachment and perhaps you resonate more with that. The next category, the next category we have is uh, disorganized attachment, which is fearful and avoidant. So what that looks like is disorganized attachment often developed through trauma or chaotic caregiving, which is kind of like a mix between anxious and avoidant tendencies. These individuals actually crave the closeness, but also fear it. And that creates this push-pull dynamic in the relationships that can feel very chaotic or confusing. An example of that is a child who experiences both love and fear from their caregivers. So perhaps they had a parent who is nurturing one moment and then abusive in the next. As a result of that, the child learns to fear the very thing that they also desire. In adulthood, they want the connection, but they're terrified of being hurt, leading to an almost constant internal conflict and inner war. Disorganized attachment creates a confusing patterns where individuals seek seek that closeness, but then they push it away out of fear. They usually struggle with trust, emotional regulation, and they often feel stuck in toxic cycles or unhealthy relationship dynamics. Disorganized attachment is one of the most complex styles because it stems from experiences where love and fear are both are basically intertwined. These individuals want the connection, but they're also deeply afraid of it. So this creates this cycle where they tend to sabotage the very relationship that they crave. Now, before I mentioned that secure attached people represent about 50% of the population, um, anxious and avoidant is something like 23 plus percent. And then there's only a small fraction, something like 5%, which are disorganized. So maybe you resonate more with that and you can notice those disorganized patterns playing out in you and it's very good to do so. It really, really helps to identify which um, pattern you can observe in yourself. This is the kind of point of this whole episode is so you can get a bit of an overview and see how these patterns might be playing out inside of you. So let's talk a little bit more about how they play out in relationships. So why... The next question is why we repeat these patterns. So the attachment patterns that we develop in childhood become the blueprint of how we relate to others, right? I mentioned that already. They really form our internal relationship, like template, if you will, which is basically how we perceive closeness, how we perceive trust, how we relate to intimacy, as adults. One of the most common dynamics that will play out, and you'll see this playing out everywhere, is the anxious avoidant trap. Where the anxious partner 
constantly seeks reassurance and closeness. And they tend to be kind of like attracted in a tragic kind of way to someone who is more avoidant. So as they seek that closeness and reassurance and connection and intimacy, the avoidant partner pulls away because they feel overwhelmed, uh, afraid of losing their autonomy, uh, scared of that emotional closeness. So this creates this cycle, this push-pull dynamic of pursuit and then withdrawal, this kind of toxic loop that ultimately leaves both parties feeling very unfulfilled and constantly triggered. On a personal note, I've seen this play out in my own life where I used to be the avoidant partner. And whenever things would get too close, I'd basically pull back needing space because that's how I felt in control. And I used the proximity in the relationship to maintain control. But the more that I withdrew, the more my partner would cling or chase me or try to create that closeness, would beg and demand and seek to find ways in. And we would basically create these loops, these dysfunctional loops with this push-pull dynamic. Somehow both of us craving that intimacy, connection, the love, the sex, the validation of having this person who we're infatuated and attracted and romantically involved with, and at the same time at the mercy of our attachment styles, because that would basically that, that was basically the coding, the blueprint that would dictate what would happen when we got close. And it would start great, you know, it starts feeling good. And then at a certain point, it becomes triggering. I would feel like, ah, I'm losing my freedom here. I have this kind of like compulsion to run, to create space, to cut contact. Because I was overwhelmed by the emotional experience and and what it created inside of me. So I would create that distance. This would trigger the shit out of her because she would feel like, ah, you're abandoning me. And so both of us would be in this very triggered place and it would, yeah, be sort of intolerable for both of us until we would calm down, we would reconnect, kind of slowly coming back towards each other and then the cycle would continue to repeat. And that anxious avoidant dance, this kind of toxic push-pull dynamic Uh, in which our attachment styles kind of like magnetized us to each other, but also created the worst kind of situation that basically confirmed our expectations around how relationships would be because the anxious person has learned that relationships aren't safe and they need to cling on to the other person to make sure that they stay close. The avoidant person is like, intimacy is overwhelming, it's scary, it's not safe for me, I need to push away and create distance. You can see how this like hooks into each other and that creates what is called the deathly dynamic. And unfortunately, we see that playing out all over the place. Once you understand this, once you see this pattern, you'll see it playing out in movies, in Hollywood, in so many relationships in this sort of public space that you can see online, celebrities, your friends, your family, you'll see these these patterns emerging everywhere. It's remarkably common. And again, that's because most of the secure people, 50% of the population is already in relationships and they're happy in relationships, they're secure. So the dating pool is disproportionately filled with avoidant people because they tend to be less inclined to stay in relationships. They like their autonomy and independence. They'll form connections and then break away. So most of the avoidant people are not in relationships. So when you go dating, you're likely to encounter a lot of avoidant people. And that's especially hard if you're an anxious person. Avoidant 
plus avoidant, they tend to avoid each other. <laughs> they get into relationships, but maybe they don't last long. They both kind of keep it casual. They hook up. They eventually at some point, they will both just value too much their autonomy and they just not, there's not enough. There's not enough need for attachment. There's not enough desire for closeness. There's not enough glue to keep it together. So remember that these patterns are like an invisible script that we kind of follow and play out unconsciously. But the good news is that once we become aware of our attachment style, we can start to rewrite those scripts. We don't have to play into the common tropes and dynamics that are playing out. We don't have to stay in the old patterns and remain stuck. And we can actually learn to create new ones that lead to healthier, more secure relationships. And in fact, we need to do that. <clears throat> so with that sort of brief overview, and there's a, there's a whole lot more I can say on each one, and I'll, I'll have a, an individual episode after this, following this episode to go deeply into each one so we can have a, you know, full breakdown analysis examples. Um, so you can have a much, much more robust and complete understanding. This, this is just glossing. It's a very deep subject. We can go into a lot of depth and I'm going to. So now we're going to go into how we can actually heal and move towards secure attachment. These are just going to be some basic, simple steps to get you started. Um, yeah, because the sooner we can move towards secure attachment, the better your life is going to be. So the step one is awareness. The first step to breaking free from unhealthy attachment patterns is recognizing them. This is the perfect moment and time to start reflecting on your childhood experiences and questioning how they may have shaped the way that you relate to others today. Ask yourself the question, what attachment style do you resonate the most with? How does it play out or show up in your relationships? Can you see a certain pattern emerging with the way that you relate to closeness, intimacy, connection? Do you cling to it? Do you crave it? Is it something that you are desperate to hold on to? Do you get anxious when it's not there? Or when things get intense, is your reaction usually to separate yourself, to avoid, to run away, to create distance and space? because you're afraid of losing your freedom and autonomy? Or are you a bit of a mix? Are you a combination of both? Are you disorganized in the way that you attach to others? Or perhaps you're secure. Maybe you're secure. 50% of people are secure. So maybe there's a good chance if you're listening to this, you might already be in a relationship and securely attached and things are amazing. But maybe your partner's not. Just because you're secure doesn't mean that your partner is. Maybe you see patterns in them. And that can be very powerful because you can basically learn to attend to their needs. You can relate to them in a way that actually speaks to their core needs and desires. So when things get difficult, you know how to respond. Awareness, 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 awareness is the key. It's the beginning. Start to educate yourself. You're here listening to this episode, so you're already taking a powerful step in that direction to familiarize yourself with the terms to spot the patterns, see how it plays out, and that's such a powerful step. Step number two is open communication. So once you're aware of your attachment style and perhaps your partner's attachment style, start communicating openly about your needs, your fears. If you are on the avoidant end of the spectrum, 
Start expressing when you need space. Don't just shut down and push that person away. Start communicating that desire, that, that need that you have for time alone to process what you're feeling so you can soothe yourself and then return to the relationship. If you're on the anxious end of the spectrum, start sharing your need for reassurance without overwhelming your partner. Communicate and say something like, hey, I get profoundly uncomfortable and afraid when you just walk out. It would help me so much if you could just tell me that you're going to come back or that you're going to take an hour and you're going to return in, you know, an hour, in 60 minutes and then we can sit down and continue this conversation. Or send me a text to just let me know that you're still thinking about me or that you're coming home. Some sort of reassurance can be really, really soothing for an anxious person. And if you are an anxious person with an avoidant, you know, validate their need for space. Valid, communicate that you, are, you can understand why they need to take space and you want them to take that space. But at the same time, you just need your reassurance. So we can navigate this. And this is definitely something we managed to do in, in my relationship. We started to communicate more openly. We started to express the needs that we have. I started to identify when she needed space or when she was feeling overwhelmed. And I would be like, I can see that you need space. Or I can, I feel like taking space, but I could see that you need closeness and reassurance. I'm here. I'm with you. Or I'm just confused at the moment. I need to take some space to cool down, but I'm coming back. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the house. I'm just going to go take some space to process what I'm feeling so I don't project it on you. It's really, really important with this communication that we don't demonize the other person's way of attaching. You know, I see online there's this huge, uh, like, villainization of the avoidant people. Like, the avoidance uh, somehow, it's become this, like, a label. It's like narcissist. We slap the avoidant label on someone and demonize them because they... Um, they shut down emotionally, they take space, they can't maintain that closeness. And of course, I'm not condoning the way that avoidant people tend to do that. It can be extremely damaging. And there are plenty of emotionally avoidant people who, uh, who weaponize that in an unconscious way and, and use it to hurt their partner. I certainly did. I certainly... Uh, caused a lot of harm with my emotional avoidance to people that I loved, to my partner. But underneath that lack of skill was a, a very valid need, was a lack of security, was a lack of safety, was a, you know, a desperation for me to isolate myself so I could feel safe. So it's really important that we don't demonize because as soon as we demonize, as soon as we label someone and slap the avoidant label on them or judge the, the way that they need to create safety for themselves, that's the, the, the worst possible way to create any kind of resolution, any kind of healing, any kind of reestablish, reestablishing of connection. And it's the fastest way to expedite the process of breaking things even more by judging. Judging never, never works, never helps. Much better to seek understanding and communicate in a way that leads to understanding on both sides. Step number three is building trust and vulnerability. So practice small acts of vulnerability which is a great way to start, whether it's expressing your feelings, 
asking for support, staying kept, you know, connected and present during difficult moments or hard conversations. We need to start building that trust and intimacy. And the way that we build trust and the way that we build intimacy is practicing small steps towards vulnerability. You don't have to rip everything open and put it all on the table. You just want to start opening. Vulnerability is the practice of being honest. It's opening up and expressing the truth of what you feel, what you think, what you need. And that is a courageous act. You know, sometimes for many of us, especially for the people who are more avoidant, they've learned that that kind of vulnerability is threatening, dangerous. It's exposing and that doesn't feel safe to them. So that that's why the small steps are necessary. And if you're on the receiving end of that, you need to be uh, empathetic and understanding and supportive and patient, validating their vulnerability. In my relationship, I was more emotionally avoidant and my partner would be asking me, you know, show me what you're really feeling. Tell me what you really think. What do you need? And in the beginning, I was like, I don't need anything. I don't feel anything. I'm fine. Just <laughs> pushing it away completely. But slowly over time, I started to see that actually it was those moments when I did express something vulnerable, the truth of what I was feeling and I was honest that actually brought us closer and, and slowly that started to feel good. That started to actually show me, actually that's the direction of getting what I want. Actually being vulnerable was helping me to get my needs met. And the more that I practiced it, it became a strength. Not something I had to run away from or avoid, but something I could lean into. And in fact, it became a superpower. I started to recognize that in order to be vulnerable, I had to be strong. And through being vulnerable, I was making myself stronger because I wasn't living in fear. I was actually turning towards my fear, facing it, opening myself, exposing myself, going deeper, 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 deeper. And that meant that even if the other person didn't react in the way that I expected them to, even if they got triggered by something that I said, I had to be strong enough to hold myself and uh, through that development of holding myself, I started to be able to hold them. I got much better at holding her in her difficult moments because I'd learned to hold myself by being more and more vulnerable. And, uh, you know, that really set me up for this work that set me up to be vulnerable with you guys and to share this stuff with you, to share my story, to open myself and expose myself to this, to the void, you know? And uh, yeah, to make it public, to share my process, to invite you guys into my inner world. So that's just an example of where it can lead. Step number four is uh, seeking support. So healing your attachment patterns can be very challenging, especially if you're dealing with very deeply rooted fears that have been compounded by decades of situations, emotional upsets, conflict, trauma. That stuff runs deep. And bringing it up and starting to dredge through the swamp of all of that stuff that's stuck inside of you, all of those fears and doubts and limiting beliefs and the patterns, the dysfunctional patterns and all of the pain that that's caused you and others throughout your life, that's not a small task. This is a multi-year, perhaps decade, multi-decade long process of working through that stuff. So therapy, coaching, joining a men's group or some sort of support group, or if you're a woman listening to this, a woman's group. 
some sort of conscious relating community can really help you to navigate this journey. With that said, when you actually start to apply yourself to this and when you really dedicate yourself to this, you can go from anxious or avoidant and find yourself in a secure relationship pretty quick. We went from dysfunctional, insecurely attached uh, and became securely attached within a year, I would say. I mean, we're still working through different stuff. But for the most part, we have a, a very secure relationship now and that went from very insecure and breaking up to the point where we were like, okay, we can rely on each other. We feel safe in the relationship. We're both committed. We know how to navigate closeness and independence. And we were both very actively working on this. It wasn't just something we were studying willy-nilly, leaving up to chance. It was like we were both having conversations about this. We were both studying, reading, educating ourselves, having those conversations, many deep connected conversations to navigate it, developing emotional intelligence, and obviously working in the coaching space, we're exposed to a lot of this stuff and yet yeah, seeing the patterns in our work with clients and, you know, this helped to move things along very quickly. Maybe for you, it takes a little bit longer than that. Maybe you can do it even quicker, especially when you get the right support. If you've got people around you who can mirror you, who can hold you in those patterns to help you see them, hold the mirror up to you lovingly and supporting you to navigate and to heal, uh, your progress will be rapid. Definitely can assure you of that. So those are the first four steps. That's just a primer. As I said, we're going to go much, much more deeply into each specific attachment style. So this is just a taste. And in terms of uh, final sort of wrapping things up, just remember that attachment theory isn't just about relationships. It's actually about understanding the deepest parts of ourselves and how we connect, how we interact with the world. By understanding your attachment style, you're taking the first step towards breaking free from old patterns and these outdated coping mechanisms. And perhaps you've got some dysfunctional ways of interacting in relationships and this is causing problems in your life. It's the first step towards breaking free and you know, extricating yourself from those old patterns that aren't really supporting you, aren't really serving you. And very, very empowering steps towards building the secure, fulfilling kind of relationships that you actually deserve and that you deep down, you desperately crave. Because I think pretty much all of us feel the call to, to having that intimate experience with someone else, that really heartfelt connection, deep intimacy, profound relation of the other. Because it's such a profound portal into the relationship with ourself, you know. <laughs> On my men's group the other day, I was talking about how the, the relationship you have with someone else is one of the biggest decisions in life. It's one of the most important decisions you can make. It's like who you choose to have beside you. Because, you know, we hear that term, that kind of slogan, you are the sum of the five people that you spend the most time with. And that's well and true, but the person that you spend the most time with, the intimate partner, the person that's living with you, sharing your bed, that knows everything about you, that person is going to define your development, your life, your the, the structure and health of your family. It's literally like your most inner, inner circle. It's the home front. 
So choosing and being very intentional with the relationship that you have closest to you is one of the most important decisions you make. And people make it very carelessly. They don't give it a lot of, you know, they treat it somehow casually or flippantly. And that is a huge disservice to yourself because if you wind up in a toxic relationship, if you wind up in something dysfunctional, your energy is going down. You are dragging yourself through the mud energetically. And I've been there. I've done that too. I've had toxic relationships in the past. The relationship that I'm in now was toxic in the beginning because it was, yeah, we didn't have the skills. We had a lot of wounding. We were in that anxious avoidant kind of dance. And it was, uh, it was toxic. And so, of course, when we're in that, like you can't get anything done. You can't advance your career. You're not having amazing states or becoming more conscious because you're, you're pulled into the, the swamp and just acting out your wounding, unconsciously projecting all of your shit onto other people, blaming them for it instead of seeing what it represents in you. So understanding your attachment style and your attachment system is just fundamental. I can't overstate how important it is to get grips on this stuff, to really invest in this education because it'll it'll change everything in the way that you relate and structure your relationships. And that obviously has, as I've just said, like profound implications for the quality and the direction of your life. So choose your relationships carefully and cultivate your relationships intentionally. Don't just leave it up to chance. That's why I always repeat this like, yes, you want to have that chemistry. You want to have that attraction to the other person. And secondary to that, you want to be ensuring that your relationship is based on growth. It's not just a comfortable easy place to be. It's actually something that challenges you. You're growing together. You're both committed to educating yourselves. You're it's like, it's a path. It's really, it is your path. It's one of your main sort of drivers in life. And if we choose it wisely and cultivate it intentionally, then it's going to be something that supports us in ways we cannot even imagine. And it's going to take you somewhere amazing. If that's the way that you choose to conduct it. So that's it for this episode. If you're ready to explore attachment styles further, stay tuned. I really appreciate you guys' feedback. Leave a comment, recommend this podcast, send it to someone else, send it to your partner, have this conversation, use it as a primer to bring this stuff out into the open in your relationship and get the conversation going because that will be very, very healing. I really appreciate when you guys leave reviews, give it a like, subscribe to the podcast, come and check out the channel on YouTube. I'm posting tons more content on YouTube uh, at the moment and it's starting to, to build. So that's exciting. If you feel like you resonate with this work and you want to get support, you feel like you're in a difficult situation uh, relationally or just in your life and you feel like you could benefit from having a mentor a coach, someone to guide you and keep you accountable and help you make much faster progress, then you might like to consider one-on-one coaching with me. If that resonates and you've been feeling called to something like that, you can check out the link to applying for one-on-one with me below this video. Some work, it's just too complex, too difficult. There's too much inertia by yourself and you, you need someone else to give you that push. And uh, that's one of my favorite things to do is to help push guys in a beneficial direction on this path of conscious masculinity. Perhaps you'd like to consider joining the Conscious Masculine Membership. That's my men's group, an online course. We dive deeply every week into these kind of topics, develop the tools, develop the skill sets, emotional intelligence, conscious masculinity, understanding attachment, 
getting the skills, sharpening each other. It's really a space where men can come together, grow alongside each other, and keep each other committed to this path of living a more connected and authentic life. There's over 20 hours of exclusive content inside the Conscious Masculine, as well as weekly group calls, challenges, accountability. There's 70 plus men in there already. So if you've been feeling the call to join a men's group and you want to take this work deeper, come, come and join us. Lastly, I'll leave you guys with this. Just remember that healing these patterns isn't just about fixing your relationships. It's about actually transforming your entire life. As you move to, towards more secure attachment, you're not only creating healthier relationships, but you're also creating the foundations of much deeper personal growth and development, more emotional resilience, and that is the, the necessary foundation on which the journey towards higher consciousness is taking place. Because we can't go high if we don't have stable foundations. We can't build the highest levels if you know the foundations are shonky and not put together well. So this, this work of establishing healthy attachment systems is is really cleaning, cleaning up the past, stabilizing the present so we can move towards the higher tiers of personal growth and development in the future. And we're going there, you know, there's just a lot of foundational stuff that I need to set up. And I want you guys to start this journey and to proceed on this path in a healthy way without bypassing all of your shit. So we're, we're building we're building steps here. We're building foundations at the moment. And we're getting higher and higher as we progress. Remember that this work actually ripples out into every aspect of your life, elevating you to a place of much greater fulfillment, depth, and purpose. So don't take this lightly. Give it the importance it deserves. Dedicate a couple of years to understanding this stuff, implementing this, fixing this, applying it to your relationship and locking it down. And that's going to serve you, trust me, amazingly well in the mid to long term. So that's it for this episode. Over the next month, I'm going to be giving you guys deep dives into each of the attachment styles to give you way more depth and understanding. And uh, yeah, I'm really pumped for it. I'm really excited to be to be sharing this. I get to learn every time I'm transmitting this stuff and and teaching it. So I get to deepen my own understanding. And I really encourage you guys to yeah to share your feedback because I'll feel more inspired. Maybe there's things that I've missed that are that are kind of key for you. If you have questions, send me a question. I can include it in the next episodes. So with that said, let's wrap it up here. I look forward to the next episodes in which we go deeper. Um, so stay tuned for that. And I will see you guys next week. All right. Aho.